I would first like to thank the International Institute for Environment and Development for inviting me to be with you all here today. Greetings from a uh, cloudy uh, morning here in New York City. Uh, my name is uh, Marco Sorellana. I am with the Center for International Environmental Law, CL, which is a public interest governmental organization that works to defend the right to a healthy environment. For a number of years, we have engaged this, this topic of investment arbitration and human rights, given the implications that uh, investment law and arbitrations have for the effective enjoyment of human rights of people on the ground, as well as for the development of uh, human rights law. Today, I am hoping to cover three main points. The basics of what is investment law and arbitration, Secondly, how are human rights relevant to investment arbitrations? <clears throat> and third, how can NGOs participate in investment arbitrations? It has been our experience that investment law and arbitration, as I said, has direct implications for human rights, and these questions will allow us then to address the central issues in the field. To start, I thought I would present a recent experience that um, we have been involved in, in a case involving El Salvador and a Canadian mining company, Pacific Rim, Pac Rim LLC, a subsidiary. The context uh, generally of this case is that uh, Pacific Rim was uh, exploring for gold in El Salvador in accordance with the legal framework then prevailing in the country. El Salvador, at the same time, is a country that is overpopulated and highly dependent on a single water source, the river Lempa, which is overused, rather polluted, and so there is this great water scarcity. As we know, gold mining presents various threats to water sources, and this led civil society, local communities, NGOs to move to defend the health of their environment and their water sources. This began as a very local struggle of uh, the local communities reacting against what they saw was um, the change in color and consistency of the water in the region. <clears throat> and soon the movement acquired national proportions. A national roundtable against mining was set up. Uh, involving uh, numerous NGOs, and that movement began to uh, be able to intervene, to be present in a national debate concerning democracy and natural resource use exploitation. So key questions of sustainable development and sustainability generally. Uh, the previous one, please. The government responded by conducting a strategic environmental assessment, uh, so beginning a process of study prior to taking decisions regarding mining exploitation. And the investor responded in turn by initiating an investment arbitration against El Salvador under ICSID, the International Center for Settlement of Investment Disputes of the World Bank. It's a center that uh, administers arbitration and under the terms of the Central American Free Trade Agreement and the investment law of the Salvador of El Salvador and the National Roundtable against mining sought to intervene in the arbitration and we did so successfully in the jurisdictional stage and I'll come back to that but these facts I think at this stage already demonstrate the relevance for human rights of investment law and arbitration which leads then to the question what is investment law and arbitration? At its core, investment law is a branch of international law that protects the rights of foreign investors and their investments. Investment law is, uh, achieves this objective uh, through various sources. Investment law sources include bilateral investment treaties, uh, foreign investment contracts. These are contracts entered into directly between the investor and the government, 
as well as customary law, which refers to a source of international law that arises out of the practice of states accompanied by a belief that uh, it is setting out a legal obligation. Customary law presents a number of standards, such as expropriation and the minimum standard of treatment, which are also reflected in bilateral investment treaties. And that takes me then to the next slide, which is what are the principal norms in investment law? And these standards include, first of all, guarantees of compensation for expropriation. If the government takes the property of an investor, which it can do under general principles of international law, it is nevertheless obliged to pay adequate compensation. The direct expropriation, so the taking of title uh, of the government by the government of the investor is usually not a problematic issue in investment law. It is more problematic to deal with situations of indirect expropriation to determine when a law of general application has the effect of an equivalent effect of depriving the investor from its property. So the investor may still have title to its property, but a law of general application such as an environmental law or a, a norm for the promotion of human rights may have an impact on expected profits. And that is the concept of indirect expropriation. Another investment law standard is the fair and equitable treatment standard. This standard is, um, is quite relative, as, as the words fair and equitable uh, denote and, and connote. <clears throat> what is fair and what is equitable is contextual and depends on the circumstances and factual issues of the case. Generally, the jurisprudence has evolved along certain lines, and this standard has been interpreted to mean that the expectations that the investor had at the time of investing need to be respected. This interpretation, based on legitimate expectations, that thus presents some tensions with the power of the government to adopt measures to promote human rights and uh, to change the legal framework in order to protect the population in situations when it becomes aware of a particular environmental risk. In those situations, the government has a constitutional and an international law obligation to protect its population, including taking regulatory measures. And if those regulatory measures affect the expectations, including the expectations of profit of the investor, then the fair and equitable treatment may enter into tension with human rights. There are two other standards worth mentioning. There are many standards, but these are the core, I would say, national treatment and most favored nation treatment, <clears throat> which generally relate to non-discrimination. So the government must treat, <clears throat> excuse me, the national investors or other foreign investors in the same way. And finally, there's the question of transfers. The foreign direct investment what it seeks uh, generally is to make a profit uh, as a result of an investment and then the ability to take out the money, uh, the, the, the profit, out of the country, out of the host country becomes a, a, a question and, and thus the guarantees of transfers enable the investors to take their money out back to where they came from or wherever they want to go. These are the principal norms in investment law and in a situation where these norms are breached or alleged to be breached by the host state, the host state is the state that receives the investment, then that leads to investment arbitration. Investment arbitration is the right of the investor to initiate uh, a mechanism for the settling dis of disputes between investors and states. Investment arbitration is based on jurisdiction. This is a concept that is central to, uh, to arbitration, in fact, to uh, me all mechanisms, international mechanisms for the settlement of disputes. And jurisdiction, at its core, refers to the power of the arbitral tribunal to hear and decide a case. So where is this power derived from? Where 
because the arbitral tribunal derived the power to hear and decide a case, it is, this power is derived from the consent of the parties. This consent may be found, for example, in the bilateral investment treaty. In the uh, uh, case that I was describing, the PAC Rim El Salvador case, CAFTA, Central American Free Trade Agreement, contains a clause that allows the investor to bring arbitral claims. El Salvador's in domestic internal investment law also allows the investor to bring arbitral claims before an international tribunal. That is where consent of the whole state is present. There are other forms of consent, but the most prevalent sources are bilateral investment treaties. And with the proliferation of bilateral investment treaties, which now number more than 3,000 <clears throat> around the world, and with the expansion of investment, foreign direct investment in volume all, also around the world, we see a, an expansion of the arbitral system of, the, of, the, of disputes that are being submitted to investment arbitration. With the expansion of disputes of bilateral investment treaties and of investments, we see a potential tensions between this field of international law and human rights and the environment. That uh, leads me to the third point in this investment arbitration, which is uh, related to the arbitration rules. How is the specific procedure governed? And this is where the arbitration rules come about. These are rules that determine what should happen in the process. ICSID contains a set of arbitration rules which are applicable in ICSID arbitrations, unless the parties otherwise decide. And the same goes for UNCITRAL rules, which are applicable in situations where the parties decide to arbitrate according to the UNCITRAL rules. Usually, this choice is given to the investor in the bilateral investment treaty the bilateral investment treaty will contemplate a menu of options that the investor can choose from. And that choice will thus determine the specific arbitration rules that will govern the procedure. These arbitration rules are quite important not only because they govern the process, but they will also determine the, the ways and possibilities in which civil society may participate in investment arbitrations. <clears throat> and in deciding whether or not to participate in investment arbitrations, that leads to a discussion of how are human rights relevant to investment arbitrations. There are various ways uh, in which uh, investment arbitrations may be implicate human rights. The investment may involve human rights issues the investor may be responsible for human rights violations or infringements, or the dispute may involve measures adopted to protect and promote human rights. In all these situations, human rights law may be relevant to the arbitration. And the question thus is, how can NGOs participate in that arbitration? And this gets us back to the question of procedural rules, the extent to which those procedural rules either in exit or in UNCITRAL or others allow for NGO non-disputing party participation. There is a tool that uh, ICSID and UNCITRAL utilize is the amicus curiae brief, describing how there are certain issues of international human rights law relevant, how there were uh, issues relevant to the arbitration involving uh, mining and empowerment and, and other issues in, in South Africa. So this is an example there. An amicus brief presents information or perspectives from civil society that help the tribunal Sorry, I decide I the case. Um, uh, so this talks to the, the point together, that the information or perspectives can... must relate to the arbitration, specifically to the issues under consideration. For uh, situations, cases where NGOs have presented or have uh, sought to intervene as, as amicus curiae, include the Methanex case uh, in the, versus the United States, a Canadian corporation that was um, alleging violations of the North American Free Trade Agreement as a result of measures adopted by the state of California to protect uh, ground drinking water. 
uh, the case of Bywater Gulf uh, in Tanzania, which involves the, the, a water concession, a privatization process. A similar case, the Suez Vivendi, Argentina, which involved also water privatization in the context of the economic crisis uh, that faced Argentina a few years ago. The Piero Foresti case that uh, Jason Brickhill addressed, and the Pac Rim case that uh, I was speaking at the beginning. If we could identify a couple lessons learned or best practices, we would have to note that uh, a a request by an NGO to the tribunal for leave to submit an amicus curiae submission should demonstrate at least four things. Uh, the, f the first thing is that the tribunal has the discretion to allow the NGO in, in, in the case. The second point is that the dispute must be suitable for public interest intervention. It could be argued that all investment arbitrations involve the public interest, but there are some investment disputes that more intensely involve the, the public interest. A third point is that the petitioner, the specific petitioner, is suitable to present public interest aspects to the question of who is the NGO, how is it funded, what is, it, what is its expertise, how can its perspectives help the tribunal? And this relates also to the final question, the desirability of allowing the petitioner to intervene in the dispute at hand.